This is Histories and Mysteries. I'm Ashley and I'm Jessica. <laughs> We're in the same place. And it's proved to be really difficult to record in the same room. We don't know how other podcasters do it when they're in the same room and their microphones don't pick each other up. We don't know how to do it. So we're using the same mic. Hi. (laughs) We're special. So special. (laughs) So on this week's episode, Ashley is going to be talking about a man named Dangerfield. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be talking about John Brown. So, um, if you don't know, there's a city in West Virginia called Harper's Ferry and Harper's Ferry was very significant in the civil war. And, um, we went on a ghost tour and we learned a lot about John Brown and Dangerfield newbie. And we thought we would share with you guys. Um, we did some more research and found some cool things out. It's wild. Yes. So let me pull up my story. I know. (laughs) All right, so I got my um, source from the Harper's Ferry Ghost Tour and Eugene L. Meyer, Five for Freedom, the African-American Soldiers in John Brown's um, Militia. And that was a book that he wrote, but then he had like a blog post on it. So, yeah. So Dangerfield Newby was born to an enslaved woman and a white man. Um, and the his mother was not enslaved to his father. So a lot of times we hear about that happening, you know, where the the slave owners kind of took advantage of and raped the the enslaved. And that's not the case in this one. Um, they actually seem to be uh, like an actual couple. But at the time, interracial marriage was illegal in Virginia. So Henry and Elsie, his parents, they still lived together as man and wife, um, even though it was illegal. And she was someone else's slave? Yeah, it was hard to find a lot of information about that. I mean, remember, this is super old. Um, But I think she was someone else's slave. And then I think Henry may have purchased her oh I, this this is all this all gives me the heebie-jeebie saying like they purchased so and so but i think that's what happened and then they lived as husband and wife so interesting yeah so dangerfield was first of their 11 children and as the law required the status of a person uh born from an interracial couple is determined by the race of the mother so because she was black, he was born as um, slaves. Him and his siblings were slaves. That's interesting. Yeah. Which is weird because I saw one article that said that like on one of the censuses, Henry had put that it was him, one white man, and then like 17, what they used to call in the day, mulatto, which is half black, half white. I've heard that term nowadays too. Yeah. It's not great. Mm. Um, and so I don't know if they were considered like his slaves or not. I don't know. Um, but eventually his father moved the whole family to Ohio. So they all became free. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then at some point, Dangerfield met his wife, Harriet, And Harriet was also enslaved and I'm not sure how they met. I couldn't find how they actually met since he was free and she was enslaved, but they did. And they became married and they had seven children, but she was enslaved to a man named Dr. Lewis Jennings in Prince William County, Virginia. And Jennings apparently was in need of some money. So he was planning on selling Harriet and her kids quote down the river, which meant down to content cotton plantations which was a really hard life oh yeah horrible so dangerfield wanted to send um wanted to obviously i hate this purchase his family um to free them and so he had to get the money for it and at this point harriet could read and write which is unusual for that time Yeah. yeah and she would send dangerfield several letters urging him to come visit her um One of her letters said, Mr. Jennings, her master's wife had been sick after giving birth to a baby girl. 
Harriet said that she had to stay with her day and night and that her own children were well. And she said, quote, I want to see you very much. Oh, dear Dangerfield, come this fall without fail, money or no money. I want to see you so much. That is one bright hope I have before me. Side note. Yes. Imagine having the first name of Dangerfield. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty awesome name. That's awesome. <laughs> wonder if we can name our children Dangerfield. Dangerfield. Um, so Harriet received a letter back and responded the same day and said, dear Dangerfield, you cannot imagine how much I want to see you come as soon as you can for nothing would give me more pleasure than to see you. It is with the greatest comfort I have thinking of the promised time when you will be here. Oh, that blessed hour when I shall see you once more. Very sweet. Uh, She sent another letter that said, it is said master is in want of money. If so, I know not what time he may sell me. And then all of my bright hopes of a future are blasted. For there has been one bright hope to cheer me in all my troubles. That is to be with you. For if I thought I should never see you, this earth would have no charms for me. Do all you can for me, which I have no doubt you will. I want to see you so much. And with added urgency, she wrote, I want you to buy me as soon as possible, for if you do not get me, somebody else will. There has been one bright hope to cheer me in all my troubles, and that is to be with you. Aww. Yeah. But how sad that you have to buy your family. I know. I can't even imagine. But why would they move there if they were originally free? Well, Dangerfield was free, but his wife wasn't. So I'm not exactly sure how they met or Or got together. Had children? Yeah. Like seven children? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so according to legend, Dangerfield saved up the money, uh, required to buy his wife and children. But when he went back to do so, Jennings said, oh, well, they're more expensive now. And at this point, Dangerfield had exhausted all of his research resources and couldn't come up with any more money. And so he was super desperate Mm -hmm. and he went to Harper's Ferry to meet up with John Brown's rebellion, which Jessica is going to talk about after during the rebellion, the Harper's Ferry residents were putting whatever they could into their muskets, anything they could find, including railroad spikes. <laughs> when she, <laughs> when the lady told us that during the haunted walk, mm-hmm. I was full flabbergasted. Yeah. Imagine having a railroad spike, like six inch railroad spike. Yeah. Hurtling towards your yeah. face. I can't. Ugh. Ugh. And that's what happened to Dangerfield. He had a railroad spike hurtling towards him and it hit him in the head and he was instantly killed. After the battle was over, the citizens of Harper's Ferry took all of their anger out on poor Dangerfield's body and they cut off pieces of him and kept them as souvenirs like we've seen in the past stories we've done. And they left the rest of him for the hogs to eat in Hog Alley. Um, poor Harriet and her children were sold down South, but she eventually remarried after the war and was free and they moved to Fairfax, Virginia and settled where she lived out the rest of her life. And yeah. And she lived by descendants of hers and danger fields as well. So yeah. And, um, there is a danger field and Harriet Newby memorial, um, on State Highway Marker in the Piedmont region of Virginia, where Dangerfield was born and raised and where Harriet was enslaved. So there is a memorial to them. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple kind of I found in different articles of what happened to him. So we heard the story of how they cut off pieces for souvenirs and they left his body in the alley to be eaten by the hogs. There's also, um, according to Willard Chambers Gump. Um, who said he had an eyewitness account uh, and it appeared in the New York Times on October 13th, 1921. Um, 1929, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the bodies were actually sent to a medical college in Virginia for use as cadavers. Oh. So there's two different stories there. And another one is that they were buried in shallow graves on the south bank of the Shenandoah River where the hogs uncovered them and ate them. Oh. So there's like a couple different stories on what actually happened to their bodies. I I guess none of them are great. But <laughs> yeah. But you know, like I said, Harriet was able to live out the rest of her life free. 
nice. Yeah. And you can still see Dangerfield's ghost. Yes. So the legend is that Dangerfield's ghost is still haunting Hogs Alley and Harper's Ferry. And um, people have seen him kind of pacing back and forth, wearing all black. And when they go to ask him what's wrong, he just kind of disappears. And they knew it was him because they said he had piercing blue eyes. So, and they said the Harper's Ferry Ghost Tour said that if you hum some Civil War songs that perhaps you would see him. So we tried, but we didn't see anything. No, No. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But Jessica is now going to tell us about the John Brown riots and all about John Brown. So you'll know a little bit more about what Dangerfield got himself into. Mm-hmm. And we switched. Could you? Oh, you unpaused it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and we switched. <laughs> Welcome to another unedited episode. <laughs> So, like Ashley had mentioned, I'm now going to talk about John Brown. And he held a really unique position in the abolitionist (laughs) movement long before his botched raid on Harper's Ferry. And not simply because he was a white man. After all, a large portion of white Americans opposed slavery for moral reasons alone. John Brown stood out from his peers because he was tired of attempting to abolish slavery through peaceful ways. Instead, he chose to use force for which he was eventually executed. Hmm. The Northerner first worked with the Underground Railroad to establish the League of Gileadites, which was an armed militia dedicated to preventing the apprehension of runaway slaves. Though it was also the one that put an end to his attempts, Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry was his most illustrious attempt. Yes. Uh, Although his invasion was ultimately unsuccessful, it helped spark the Civil War by encouraging many others to oppose slavery, even if it meant using violence. At his execution, there was a note found on him that read, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land can never be purged away but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. Wow. How crazy. Yeah. That's intense. Yeah. Ruth Mills and Owen Brown, both Calvinists, welcomed their son, John Brown, into the world on May 9th, 1800 in Torrington, Connecticut. Brown's father, a tanner by trade, installed in him the moral wrongness of slavery at a young age and made their house a safe station on the Underground Railroad. That's awesome because that's that's so rare back then, you know? Yeah. Underground Railroad was just wild. Yeah. When Brown was 12 years old, he saw the brutality of slavery firsthand when he observed a black boy being thrashed in the streets as he traveled through Michigan. Mm. He was haunted by the encounter for many years and would continue to think about it throughout his life. The Brown family relocated to Hudson in rural Ohio when Brown was a little boy, according to the Smithsonian. Hey, which we're going to tomorrow. We are one of them so excited (laughs) at this time the number of native americans was rapidly declining and despite this the browns made friends with the local native americans there which is so nice Mm -hmm. they just seem like very accepting yeah yeah like a very nice accepting family Mm -hmm. as conductors on the Underground Railroad, Brown and his father continued to assist fugitive slaves to safety. No one had more of an impact on Brown's moral philosophy towards slavery than his father. Brown experimented with a number of professions, including farmer, tanner, surveyor, and wool merchant. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> like, holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this part is what I don't know why I keep looking over here. There's nobody over here. Um, <laughs> He had 20 children. 
20 20 children children. yeah he's like a historical nick cannon yeah he had two (laughs) marriages he had two marriages one of whom was adopted and black oh sadly both his first wife and half of his children passed away in infancy oh that's awful like awful yeah he also showed his anti-racist beliefs in his neighborhood by eating with the black folk and addressing them as mr and mrs additionally he strongly opposed segregated church seating okay Brown's Calvinist upbringing had persuaded him that his main goal in life was to wage war against slavery. During his first meeting with Frederick Douglass in 1847, Brown started to develop his plan to fight slavery. Seems weird that like 47 years into your life. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that is weird. Midlife crisis? Yeah. I mean, good on him. Yeah. Still. (laughs) It just seems like a long time to wait. Yeah, yeah, it does. Abolitionist Garrett Smith persuaded Brown and his family to go to North Elba, New York, a year later in 1848. As a result of Smith's establishment of a Black settlement over a 50-acre plot of land there, Brown saw a chance to advance his anti-slavery initiative. As a leader and kind of father to them, he first developed his own farm there and assisted enslaved. Did I say assisted? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and assisted enslaved families with their agricultural labor. Hmm. It was here that he taught local black families how to farm and become self-sufficient, which is so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Brown also sought to expand his underground railroad endeavor through the mountains which was armed along the way with fellow abolitionists the objective of this was to invade plantations and free as many slaves as possible from there which he thought would force the slave economy to collapse which is like a very noble thought Mm -hmm. when you think of it yeah this strategy had tactical sense even if brown ultimately failed to conduct it properly (laughs) despite the fact that he never carried it out he still failed yeah it effectively served as the pattern for the raid on harper's ferry however according to national park services chief chief historian at harper's ferry dennis fry the plan could have succeeded Hmm. which sucks that it didn't yeah Brown knew that he couldn't free 4 million people, he said, but he understood economics and how much money was invested in slaves. There would be a panic. Property values would dive. The slave economy would collapse. So like. A good idea. Yeah. In in concept. Yeah. That's the thing. Like all the fundamentals were there. It was just, there were so many different things lined up against them. Okay. For Brown, the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was a pivotal moment. The law imposed severe penalties on anyone who assisted fugitive slaves, and Brown and other abolitionists considered violence as the only viable response to this illegality. In response, Brown established, like we said earlier, the League of Gileadites, that was tasked with assisting and defending fugitive slaves. Under a concept known as popular sovereignty, Congress approved slavery in both Kansas and Nebraska in 1854. Brown expressed his government's regret for these choices in a letter to his father. And as if he needed further motivation to resort to (laughs) <laughs> to resort to violence. In May 1856, he discovered that Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who was the most vocal abolitionist in the Senate, had been assaulted on the Senate floor by a member from South Carolina. Oh, wow. Like, how insane is that? Yeah. Uh, Five pro-slavery men were then dragged from their cabins in Kansas's Potawatomi Creek by Brown and his men in retaliation. 
they killed them by hacking at them with shards of glass. Oh my gosh, that's violent. That's violent, so personal. Yeah. And imagine how long that would have taken. Yeah. That's crazy. Even abolitionists expressed their distress about what they had done, but Brown just retorted saying, God is my judge. Wow. Kind of ballsy. Yeah. It's it's hard because what they were doing to the slaves or enslaved people is so violent and so awful. I understand wanting to become violent as well, you know, Mm -hmm. like retaliation, right? Yeah. 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 And enslaved people, a lot of times couldn't retaliate, you know, because they would get torture basically yeah like if we remember madame lalori yeah yeah she was awful for that yeah just terrible i don't understand why that was even a thing yeah um at this point it was war between the two opposing sides like we have just mentioned because it was just constant retaliation between the Mm -hmm. two parties right even Brown's own son, Frederick, was shot to death by oh. a pro-slavery man. Oh. And this starkly reminded Brown of his own mortality. He said, I only have a short time to live, only one death to die, and I will die fighting for this cause. Wow. In order to fully plan the Southern invasion he had been planning for the previous 10 years, Brown departed Kansas in 1858. He intended to lead a small militia into Virginia, seize the government reserve kept at Harper's Ferry, and spark a slave insurrection in the surrounding areas. He could not have imagined that this would be called the dress rehearsal for the Civil War. Wow. Yeah, this is kind of like the leading up to it. Wow. Brown purchased thousands of pikes and hundreds of carbine rifles using money from a wealthy group of abolitionists who were known as the Secret Six. He believed that after taking Harper's Ferry, his soldiers would be able to access the thousand more weapons kept there in the Federal Reserve. Just 61 miles northwest of Washington, D.C., the massive Federal Armory included a musket factory, rifle works, an arsenal, multiple mills and a significant railroad junction therefore it was a super place to start a revolution yeah for sure had everything you needed yeah and when we were there last night like you can just tell like there were what five or six trains that came through there yeah it was crazy Mm -hmm. so you can only imagine and there's like two separate railroad lines too yeah so So you get a lot in and out of there yeah it was and the rivers are there mm-hmm. the shenandoah and the potomac mm-hmm. right yep so it was just perfect spot yeah and it was nice and close to charlestown right so mm-hmm. it was really beneficial to washington as well mm-hmm. with fun fact charlestown was named after his brother charles because he owned the town yes <laughs> When John Brown encountered Harriet Tubman, who had already freed dozens of slaves during eight previous excursions to Maryland's eastern shore, his plans for the invasion appeared to come together. Brown referred to her with respect, calling her General Tubman, which is so sweet. (laughs) And she regarded him as the greatest white man alive. Wow. That's going to be saying a lot because I feel like as a Black woman at that woman at that time. Mm -hmm. I would not be very fond of white people. Yeah. It didn't matter what they were doing. I would not like white people. Yeah. So it's crazy because like they worked together. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. yeah it's crazy. It shows a lot about Harriet Tubman and who she was. You exactly. Know? <clears throat> he recognized that difficult decisions were necessary for abolition, which was essentially the source of her emotion. He had previously guided 12 runaway slaves across perilous terrain inhabited by pro-slavery guerrillas and American soldiers to safety in Canada. In your home country. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. This victory gave him the confidence that he could capture Harper's Ferry. He asked Frederick Douglass for assistance, but he didn't think that Brown would be successful, so he declined to help him. Oh, no. 
and Harriet Tubman helped him to find people to like join their little party but she didn't want to help any further because she was afraid that the Underground Railroad would be discovered and ultimately destroyed. Yeah, and that was most important at that time for her. Exactly. Yeah, and many people. Yeah. So on October 16th, 1859, at night, Brown and eight of his men arrived in Harper's Ferry. Brown gave an order for a group to seize control of the arsenal, rifle works, and musket factory. His soldiers used a fire engine house as a fortress while taking hostages. The telegraph cables were then cut and the soldiers took control of the railroad station to stop any outside forces from receiving distress signals. But at the station, a free black man by the name of Hayward Shepard was killed after he posed a threat to General Brown's troops. Which I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah. And I didn't include it in this, but Brown was really dependent on the surrounding um, African Americans Mm -hmm. to join their cause and help out. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. Yeah. He called them the little working bees because Mm -hmm. they were like, there were so many of them. Um, and none of them came to help. Mm. Like maybe a couple did, but nobody came to help. So they were just like very outnumbered. Yeah. I can see that though. I mean, how terrifying would that be as an enslaved person at the time to try and start a rebellion? Because whatever's done to you is going to be 10 times worse than what they're going to do to a white man. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the railroad bridge (laughs) sorry everybody (laughs) she lost her spot (laughs) the railroad bridge was taken over by the jefferson guards who arrived earlier blocking brown's sole exit Mm. soon after armed militias from maryland virginia and other states descended upon Harper's Ferry and surrounded Brown and his men as they took cover in the fire engine building. And for those of you that don't know this area very well, which I didn't, (laughs) it's, and if you're from Canada, it's really hard for us to kind of comprehend it because our provinces are in a straight line, (laughs) but here their states are just like mishmashed. Yeah. So we drove through Pennsylvania to get here. And then all of a sudden we were in Maryland and then we were right back in Pennsylvania. (laughs) And then we were in Virginia at some point, maybe. Probably. Probably. And then all of a sudden we were in West Virginia. (laughs) (laughs) And then when we were going to Gettysburg yesterday, we were in virginia and then literally 10 seconds later we were back in west virginia then at some point we were in maryland (laughs) (laughs) so (laughs) it might sound like it's kind of far away for all these different militia forces to be coming from these different states but it's not it's not they're so close together Mm -hmm. so just to kind of put that into perspective because i would never have known i've been like holy crap they came from far away how did this like end so quickly they're super close together (laughs) (laughs) so um i'm really bad at this i'm sorry guys (laughs) i'm just gonna highlight it for her get so excited about it (laughs) watson age 24 was shot in the street after brown sent him out to present a white flag of surrender (gasps) causing him to crawl back gravely injured they're not supposed to do that and that was his son (gasps) oh some of brown's soldiers leaped into the shenandoah or potomac 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 rivers and were shot dead when the militias seized the firehouse others ultimately gave in and they survived this turbulent day gave way to the hopeless evening No one had eaten in 24 hours, and almost every single person had been wounded. Oliver, who was Brown's 20-year-old son, was dead on the floor. 
Watson wailed in agony from his injuries and Brown told him to die. And he said, quote, as becomes a man. So he basically just told his son to die. And that was the honorable thing to do. Like just die. He didn't care. The helpless group was surrounded by about a thousand men. Even President James Buchanan participated in putting an end to the uprising. To put down Brown's uprising, Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee, a former slave owner, commanded an army. One of his assistants approached Brown's stronghold in the dead of night while carrying a white flag. When Brown knocked on the door, he requested permission to go back to Maryland and free the remaining captives. And this argument was dismissed. The assistants announced the approach of Lee's troops and Brown could have shot the man as easily as I could kill a mosquito, as he later described. Lee's soldiers, however, conducted a building raid using all possible entrances after Lee made the decision not to. A saber nearly killed Brown, but it only wounded him when it touched his belt buckle. Hmm. He was then beat continuously over the head until he was knocked out. If the blade had struck a quarter inch to the left or right, up or down, Brown would have been a corpse. And there would have been no story for him to tell. And there would have been no martyr. Hmm. How crazy. That is crazy. The day prior, Harper's Ferry was taken by 19 men. Ten of them perished in the violence while five were now detained. Over a dozen militiamen were injured and four townspeople perished. During the Harper's Ferry raid, only two of Brown's men were able to cross the Potomac and escape. Oh, wow. During the attack on Harper's Ferry, every individual who was apprehended was accused of treason, first-degree murder, and conspiring with Negroes to produce insurrection. Mm. After a trial that took place on October 26, 1859 in Charlestown, Virginia, the death penalty hung over all of them. Brown received his death sentence on November 2nd and was put to death a month later. During his trial, he stated, quote, in the first place, I deny everything but what I have all along admitted. The design on my part to free the slaves I never did intend murder or treason or the destruction of property or to excite or incite slaves to rebellion or to make insurrection. On December 2nd, Brown was escorted out of jail by six infantry companies as his wagon rolled up to a scaffold and he sat on his own coffin. As the sack was placed over his head, Brown told the executioner, Don't keep me waiting longer than necessary. Be quick. Robert E. Lee, Thomas J. Jackson, afterwards known as Stonewall Jackson at the Battle of Bull Run two years later, and John Wilkes Booth, who was the man that would assassinate Abraham Lincoln, were all present during his execution. Thus, John Brown became a hero of the abolitionist movement, as well as a violent, treacherous guy to those wishing to keep slavery. There you go. Interesting. I started storming out. (laughs) Real bad. (laughs) Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Holy macaroni. Sorry for the really heavy episode. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't like that. Do you have any jokes? No. Do you? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be all of you. <laughs> yeah, and next week when we record, we'll get a bit more into um Jessica's trip and everything we did, how much fun we had. Um, but we're kind of in the middle of it right now and um just doing lots of stuff and our kids are downstairs waiting on us. So we are going to adjourn the podcast, but uh, we will bring you two new stories and a bunch of fun Jessica and I stories next week. Bye guys. Bye.